When you are new on the scene, uh, as I am, it takes extra work. Uh, I think that's uh, part of why you see the VP's got a big advantage there right now, but that's nothing that uh, I can't earn my way into. The important thing is to keep up that engagement. When people hear our message, they love it, but I gotta get out there and sell it. And that's especially true as somebody who doesn't have years or decades of familiarity on the national scene. It's Wednesday, November 20th. I'm Julie Pace, Washington Bureau Chief for the Associated Press. And this is Ground Game. Democrats hang on to their only governorship in the Deep South, despite President Donald Trump's efforts to swing the race in Louisiana back to the GOP. These are very dishonest people. Democrats are trying to overthrow the last election because they know they're not going to win the next election. That's all it is. So are there any lessons learned for the parties out of the Louisiana race? And can Democrats really make up ground throughout the South in 2020? I honest to God believe with Trump out of the way, you're going to find people screwing up a lot more courage than they had before to say, OK, OK, I can cooperate. I can move now. I, I, I have more leeway. Southern states may also be make or break for candidates in the Democratic presidential primary, where black voters, one of the most important Democratic constituencies, have enormous sway. We'll dig into how Democratic candidates are trying to appeal to black voters and how those appeals are being received. Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards held off his Republican challenger over the weekend. He's the only Democratic governor in the Deep South, an area where Democrats have basically been wiped out of statewide office. Edwards' victory offers Democrats a glimmer of hope in that region, but it may not be a sign of a broader shift across the South. I am joined by Bill Barrow. Nobody knows Southern politics better than him. He's AP's national political reporter based in Atlanta. Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So this Louisiana race is really interesting. John Bell Edwards uh, had served four years as governor of Louisiana. It was looked at by a lot of political analysts as kind of a fluke, a state that Republicans should be able to take back. And yet he won again. But you wrote uh, coming out of this election that Democrats should be careful to not draw too many sweeping conclusions about their prospects out of this race. What do you mean by that? And why is this almost a a one-off for Democrats? Louisiana. Louisiana is particularly unique, and I know a lot of states may say that. I think it's actually true with Louisiana because you've always had this history of the heavy Roman Catholic population that does include many Democrats who have stayed in the Democratic Party, even with the partisanship in the South, but have always opposed abortion rights. And then with the cultural conservatism of the South and other issues have been you know, less amenable to stricter gun regulation, some of these hot button issues that have sort of separated the party. So you've had some Democrats there that that can check those boxes. And John Bell is one of those. And he was elected four years ago with those advantages and the added bonus of running against David Vitter, who had become an extremely unpopular U.S. senator for a lot of reasons. What he was able to do, maybe a kind of a fluky win or not necessarily fluky, but a lot of things had to go his way, a sort of perfect storm to get elected. Well, then once you do win in these states where you go against the partisan grain, you've got four years actually to do the job and build your own brand. The flip side of this is looking at Charlie Baker, the Republican governor of Massachusetts, Larry Hogan, the Republican governor of Maryland, who win in sort of a sweep year for their parties nationally in these Democratic states, but then get reelected easily because voters in the middle in those states aren't really changing their stripes and their federal preferences, but they're looking at their governor saying, you know what, this guy's actually doing a good job and I'm okay with it. John Bell Edwards ran on issues like education in Louisiana. He ran on the economy in Louisiana. He expanded Medicaid. And I think this is really notable. You know, on some major issues, he broke with his party, right? I mean, he's not a Democrat who could win in probably California or New York. Right. He wouldn't win the nomination in those states. Now, his supporters and his... uh, campaign aides and and his inner circle are also careful to say, yes, he breaks from the party on some of, again, these hot button cultural issues that get so many headlines. They say he's still an unapologetic capital D Democrat. For example, you know, his ads didn't revolve around, I love the Second Amendment, I oppose abortion rights, uh, even though those things are true. His ads revolved around, I gave teachers a pay raise. I restored some of the previous cuts to Louisiana's universities. I expanded Medicaid and and health insurance coverage to a half million Louisianians. I mean, those are not ads that a Republican would be running in Louisiana. 
And certainly President Donald Trump and Republicans put in a ton of effort to try to knock Edwards out of office. Trump made two visits to the state in the weeks before the election. Do you take anything away from the fact that the Republican couldn't get over the finish line even with Donald Trump's full support behind him? I wouldn't draw too many conclusions that are applicable everywhere. I will lean on a very good Republican pollster that I talked to, some Whit Ayers, who has worked extensively across the South. And he said, look, candidates matter. Candidates always matter. And that gets underappreciated when presidents come in and try to use their coattails. And he said, too much can be made of that. And in this instance, um, you know, the armchair quarterbacking, even from Republicans, as quietly that Eddie Rispone, the Republican whom John Bell defeated, uh, didn't just take Donald Trump's help. That's basically all his argument was. He did not affirmatively tell his own story as a businessman. He did not put out a policy slate for Louisianians to consider uh, as a counter to John Bell Edwards. He just hugged the president repeatedly. And again, with John Bell having established his own brand, that was not enough. And on, on the one hand, that tells you something about Trump, but it doesn't necessarily mean Trump's anywhere close to being vulnerable in a state like Louisiana, or even that he couldn't still, you know, put together a reelection campaign and in, in other genuine battlegrounds in other parts of the country. So Louisiana may be a unique case, and I think you're right on that bill, but certainly Democrats, as we look toward the 2020 general election, are really eager to make up ground in other places in the South, most notably your home state of Georgia, where Democrats got awfully close in the 2018 governor's race. Hillary Clinton flirted with the state a little bit in 2016. What is the landscape in Georgia right now? Obviously, we don't know who the Democratic nominee is going to be, which will answer some of the questions. But how realistic do you think the prospects are of a Democratic nominee really aggressively playing in Georgia in November 2020? It's really interesting. What you will see is President Trump, I think, play heavily in Georgia because he knows there's no path to 270 for him if he loses a state like Georgia, which is still, I think, a a Republican lean. It's moving toward undisputed battleground status, but Republicans still uh, are favored here slightly. He won this state by five percentage points in 2016. He can come here and both raise money for Republicans in Metro Atlanta, but also go into South Georgia and generate the huge crowds that he loves. So I think you'll see the president come here a lot. Democrats play here, as you referenced, I think will depend somewhat out of the gate on on whom who they nominate. The, the conventional wisdom is that you know, someone more towards the center from the mainstream establishment of their party would be able to take better advantage of Trump's struggles in these northern Atlanta suburbs with a lot of white college educated Republican leaners that are unhappy with the president. And that perhaps someone like Elizabeth Warren probably could not tap into that as easily and might not put Georgia on the map. So that's step one. Step two would just be how much money they have. You know, Democrats don't have to have Georgia to get to 270. That's not their primary path. It is a primary path for Trump. So he has to come protect his home turf. If Democrats do raise money and can build the kind of national organization, I think we would see them here, if nothing else, just pressuring President Trump and Republicans to have to spend their boatloads of money here because every dime spent in Georgia is not spent in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Ohio and and North Carolina. I think that's such an important point, Bill. It's not just Democrats fighting in Georgia to actually win the state. It's fighting to put President Trump on defense. Now, the advantage he has is that if his fundraising holds up, he's got a ton of money. He can play pretty much everywhere. But if he has to go campaign in Georgia in the closing days of the 2020 election, uh, that's not where he wants to be. He wants to be in those other states you mentioned, Michigan, Pennsylvania. If you know, from his perspective, he wants to pick off places like Minnesota or even New Mexico. I want to pick up, though, on one other state you mentioned there, North Carolina. So I covered the 2008 Obama election. North Carolina was seen by the Obama campaign as just this embodiment of the shifting South. Obama was able to pick that state off from Republicans. He held his convention in Charlotte in 2012, and then the state shifted back to the Republicans. What is the landscape in North Carolina right now? Is this really a purple state, or is this a state that kind of had a fluky Democratic win in 2008 and has shifted back to sort of its natural position? I think the last few cycles of results would suggest that North Carolina has achieved just genuine battleground status. Now, some Republicans may argue on that a little bit, But unlike Georgia, where 
The burden is on Democrats to prove it because they haven't yet broken through. They're knocking on the door, but they haven't gone through it. They've actually gone through it in North Carolina. As you referenced, President Obama, then Senator Obama, won North Carolina, I think by what, 20 or 30,000 votes. It was very, very close, but he won it in 08. And then the state went way back to the right. You know, the, the wisdom hindsight analysis is that when they won absolute control of the state house in a still closely divided state, they overplayed their hand. And now you have a Democratic governor in North Carolina who will be on the ballot running for re-election next year. You have a senator, first-term Senator Tom Tillis, who will be on the ballot and who absolutely could win re-election, but is going to be in a genuine dogfight. All the numbers suggest that. And the, the electoral makeup there, it is a mix, as we've seen in Virginia, which is sort of the, the other side of the coin of Georgia. That's a still sort of a battleground status, but the needle keeps going further and further and more solidly to Democrats because of the change in demographics, the shift in the suburbs, the urbanization of Northern Virginia. You know, North Carolina is the next state that demographically, as you go southward down the Atlantic seaboard, where just the migration patterns within the country of attracting new people, you know, younger people that are moving out of the northeastern cities because they're so expensive or moving out of the midwestern cities or small towns just, you know, because it's cold and they want to get out and find, go to the Sun Belt and find better economic opportunities. You know, Virginia's been a beneficiary of that. It's changed the political landscape. North Carolina's right behind Virginia on that trend. And then Georgia's a few steps behind North Carolina as you kind of watch the that blue concentration of the northeast sort of just migrate down the eastern seaboard. And as a result, we talk in North Carolina and Georgia then about the suburbs. And we've seen, you know, in 2018 midterms, some of the uh, special elections that have happened since then, that during the Trump administration, the suburbs have just moved increasingly toward Democrats. I mean, that's where I'll really be watching in a North Carolina and a Georgia. I assume you will, too. Yes. And And it's worth noting the takeaway that you could pull from some of these other states that had these odd year elections, even though they're so heavily Republican, even In those states, Kentucky, where a Democrat won the governor's race, Mississippi, where Democrats lost but narrowed the gap, and Louisiana, where Edwards was reelected, those suburban trends also played out in those states. Now, again, localized elections, but it still fit with a national trend. The difference in those states versus a North Carolina or Georgia is just the math, The, the suburban population, the metro population in Louisiana with 4.6, 4.7 million people just isn't enough to overcome Republicans' natural advantage. But the dynamics were still there. The suburbs south of Memphis, Tennessee and Mississippi and east of Jackson, Mississippi and Rankin County trended toward Democrats, even though Republicans still won them. So that suburban trend, Republicans are seeing that everywhere and they are nervous about that. So much to watch in the coming months. I love talking Southern politics with Bill Barrow, AP's national political reporter based in Atlanta. Bill, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Next up on Ground Game, we look at how Democratic candidates are trying to appeal to black voters, one of the most powerful voting blocks in America. It's all but impossible to become the Democratic presidential nominee without significant support from black voters. That's how Barack Obama became the nominee in 2008 and how Hillary Clinton secured the nomination in 2016. So it's no surprise that the current crop of Democrats are urgently making appeals to black voters as the primary contest near. Erin Haynes is AP's national race and ethnicity writer, and she spent the last several months really diving into these questions of how the Democratic candidates are trying to build their support with black voters and how those overtures are being received. Erin is joining us from Atlanta, where she was just at an event with Pete Buttigieg at Morehouse. She's on her way to South Carolina, the first primary contest that will really give us a sense of where black voters are in the 2020 contest. Erin, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to be here. This is fun because this is basically going to be a version of the conversation Aaron and I have been having uh, ourselves over the phone for the last couple of months. Aaron, I want to just start with this event at Morehouse. Pete Buttigieg was there. Buttigieg is having a real moment in Iowa, the first primary contest, but he is really struggling with black voters. Give us a sense, put us in the room with him at this event. What was his appeal and how was he being received? Buttigieg is trying to build on the momentum that he has in Iowa to convince Black voters that he is somebody that they should take a look at as their choice for nominee. So he went to Morehouse College, a historically black college in Atlanta, ahead of the debate, which is going to be in Atlanta later this week, to really make the case to black voters, especially young black voters on that campus, about what he 
would do for them. He has a plan, the Douglas Plan, which is named for abolitionist Frederick Douglass, that is aimed at addressing systemic racism uh, in America in areas like education, housing, jobs, to really right some of the institutional wrongs that have been done to Black Americans. And that is an idea that is really a lot more robust uh, than some of the other candidates have had specifically aimed at communities of color. But he has not really been able to uh, translate that into Black support uh, in the months since he announced his candidacy. This is a case that he's been making in front of Black and white audiences to get everybody kind of on board with the idea of leveling the playing field for Black folks in this country, but not sure really why he's not gaining that much traction. I will also say, though, that of the top tier candidates, all of whom are white, at least at this point, none of them, uh, aside from Joe Biden, has really managed to galvanize a significant Black support, which we know is going to be a key to electability headed into this primary in a few months. And this is so interesting because there's been so much talk at the national level about weaknesses in Joe Biden's candidacy. He had a bunch of gaffes over the summer. He sometimes looks out of step with the party. But the one thing that has been really consistent is that Joe Biden's support among black voters is just head and shoulders above the rest of the field. Why is that? What is it about Joe Biden? What is it about his connection to the black community that has proven so far to be so enduring? Well, you know, Joe Biden obviously has a long political career, and a lot of people tend to associate that with his relationship to working class white voters. But in fact, uh, you know, his home state of Delaware is one of the most populous states in terms of black population, approaching something like 40 percent of the state is black. People don't really know that. And so he has had a longstanding relationship with the black community throughout his political career. And I think that that combined with, you know, folks more recent memory of him as vice president to the country's first black president is something that gives Black voters, a lot of confidence. And we also know that Black voters, not unlike a lot of Democrats, are prioritizing beating President Trump in 2020. And at least at this point, they see Joe Biden as the candidate who is best positioned to do that. And until they see somebody more viable to beat President Trump next year, uh, at least at this point, they are sticking with Joe Biden. And you're heading to South Carolina, as we mentioned, the state where we'll get our first glimpse of where Black voters really are as they actually go to the polls and lay down their markers. You've been in that state a bunch over the last couple of months talking to voters, seeing how the candidates are trying to make these appeals. Is there anybody else that you get a sense of is gaining traction there, could make up some ground on Biden? It's really unclear. I mean, Joe Biden really does have a firewall in South Carolina, particularly uh, with Black voters. I mean, polls are, are consistently showing solid support for him from Black voters in that state. Uh, and, and that is really what has kept him ahead in the polls. I mean, the South Carolina primary electorate is something like two thirds African American. So to your point, I mean, this will be a significant test of what Black voters are going to do uh, in next year's primary. As much as some of these other candidates have been in South Carolina, I mean, I think uh, Senator Kamala Harris of California is making her 15th trip to South Carolina this weekend. That is not translating into Black support. No one has been able to really erode support that Black folks in that state have for Joe Biden, who will also be back in the state this week. But I think, you know, between South Carolina and the debate being in Atlanta, which is a majority Black city that, you know, says can say a lot about Black voters kind of in the South and nationally, the Black vote is definitely coming into focus uh, this week in particular. You mentioned Kamala Harris. Uh, She is one of two high profile black candidates in the Democratic primary, the other being Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. Both of these candidates jumped into the race with quite a bit of potential. Harris in particular had this big opening launch in Oakland. She's had her sorority sisters out there really mobilized for her. Cory Booker has been trying to work some of his networks. What's going on, though, here? Why do they seem to have not taken off? Why do Black voters appear a little skeptical about their prospects right now? So, Julie, I'll say, you know, what I've been hearing on the campaign trail, it it really is coming down to, again, a question of electability. And both uh, Senator Harris and Senator Booker have said, you know, that they understand that they are also running, in addition to, you know, the campaign that, that all of the 2020 Democratic hopefuls are running, they are running a campaign of belief, right? They are having to convince voters, particularly Black voters, that they are someone who can win in 2020. And, you know, right now, that is not something that is happening. You know, I will also say Black voters, like a lot of Democratic primary voters, are still shopping. And these uh, candidates, like a lot of the candidates are still, Senators Harris and Booker do have some name recognition, especially, you know, kind of with some of their high profile appearances in, in Senate hearings for the past couple of years. 
you know, people are still getting to know them. There are a lot of people who still don't know either of them or, or uh, frankly, a lot of the other in this very crowded field. So they're still introducing themselves. But black voters are pragmatic. And, you know, like I said, they want somebody who can beat President Donald Trump next year. And they, at least at this point, are not seeing either Senator Harris or Senator Booker as the candidates that are in position to do that than, than Vice President Biden. So Harris, Booker are in the race. And then, Aaron, we had a last minute surprise in the Democratic primary. Deval Patrick, the former governor of Massachusetts, jumped in the race. He is hoping that he can gain some momentum very, very quickly. He'll be in South Carolina. You're going to see him. What is Deval Patrick's play here? So, yeah, I'm actually headed to South Carolina to see Deval Patrick in that state in action for the first time. He's going to be meeting with some small business owners and, and really making the case to the black voters in that state for the first time about why his 11th hour our bid is something that they should consider. You know, the black candidates who are currently in the race, Senator Harris and Senator Booker, have not necessarily made inroads with black voters. But Deval Patrick is actually seen as somebody who could have a broad appeal to a diverse electorate. So not just black voters, but convince white voters that he also is somebody that they should be looking at. And so, you know, when we talk about electability, so often we talk about for the white candidates who are kind of in this top tier status, whether they can attract black voters, but now you're going to have three pretty high profile African-American Democrats. And the question for them, as much as it is for white candidates, is can these black candidates really have a broader appeal to a white electorate that could then maybe convince black voters that they are electable? There is one candidate, Aaron, that we've talked about, you and I, a little bit on this topic, and that's Elizabeth Warren, who you've been at some events with her um, where she was speaking to predominantly black women, where she's gotten a really great reception. And I think one of the things we'll be watching in the next couple of months is whether that you know does translate into votes. How has she been received in front of these audiences? And is she somebody that you think has a chance of cutting into Biden's support, particularly, as I mentioned, with black women? Well, I think that that's definitely the case that she is trying to make. I mean, we're going to see it again this week, actually, coming out of the debate. She is going to also be at a historically black college here in Atlanta, Clark Atlanta University, where she is speaking specifically to Black women. Uh, She's going to deliver an address talking about Black women and the labor movement, getting very specific in wanting to reach that audience and to let them know that she understands them and and what her plans are for that community. And I think that that is something that we have seen uh, Black women responding to on the campaign trail. Uh, You know, her signature, I have a plan for that, is something that always draws cheers, but also, you know, her experiences as a young mother with young children with the challenges of childcare, how she's able to kind of have that conversation, but then pivot to talk about how she understands that even as she struggled, she knows that Black women have an even more difficult struggle. So kind of addressing her white privilege, even as she is connecting with them over those shared challenges of motherhood and child care is something that has resonated with those audiences as well. And she's also meeting, you know, kind of privately with uh, Black women activists to hear from them. And, and, and a lot of them say that they feel like she really has listened to them about their priorities. They have challenged her as a progressive white woman on whether, you know, that she will actually support their priorities if elected president. And so she's taken some tough questions from them and and they respect her for that. So she's definitely getting a look from black women, especially who are the backbone of the Democratic Party and are going to be hugely important in this primary. You know, we'll see how that translates into votes come early next winter. Fascinating. So much to dig into here, Erin. Erin Haynes is AP's national race and ethnicity writer. You'll be hearing from her a lot on ground game. She's really focused on where Black voters are in the 2020 primary, as she mentioned, the backbone of this party. Erin, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week's Ground Game from the Associated Press. We'll be here every Wednesday for the latest political news from the Beltway and beyond. Be sure to tell a friend about us and please subscribe, rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. From the Westwood One Podcast Network.